Okay, Tanakoto Katoa, no mai haramai, ka Robin Wilkinson toku ingwa. Ke ko nga moana fakoka aho e mahiana. He kai tohu tohu aho. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. So, I'm Robin Wilkinson, and I'm the communications manager at Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. So, I'm facilitating today. Um, so just welcome you all to jump into the chat function and introduce yourself, where you are and what you do, just sort of give an idea of who it is that is here. I see Ryan has said howdy. Hello. Tony Jones from Napier, Liz Allen, Frank of Bruce from Newa Christchurch. Oh, yeah, they're coming in thick and fast. <laughs> no, no, sort of reading them out for the benefit of the recording, but um, yeah, they're coming through thick and fast. So we've got coastal planners, marine ecologists, some lots of regional council, fisheries New Zealand, MFE. Wow, yes, I definitely, my eye, every time I focus, it, uh, it flicks on by, but great to see so many people here today um, from exactly the groups that we were hoping would be here. Um, so sure it'll be spot on, hopefully, for you people. Um, I'll just give another minute so that uh, anyone that got unexpectedly waylaid has a, has a chance to log in and not miss anything. Oh, I was about to start reading again because it had stopped coming through, but new messages are still popping up. <laughs> All right. This was, uh, we, we did have an awful lot of registration, so it's good to see that, um, yeah, there's clearly a lot of people uh, putting their name in there. So thank you all. So today, this webinar, in this webinar, Judy Hewitt um, from Sustainable Seas Challenge and Megan Carbines from Auckland Council, will give a very quick um, overview of seven key lessons for resource managers to consider when designing long-term monitoring programs for estuaries. Um, a quick reminder that this webinar is aimed at marine resource managers and end users, so the content will be more technical and detailed than some of our previous webinars. Um, and hopefully you've all seen the e-version of the guidance. We'll include a link to it in our post-webinar email um, when we send you um, and everyone that registered the recording link. So we'll, ha we'll have the resources in there as well. Um, if you're someone that's requested a print copy and it hasn't already arrived with you, then one should be on its way. Um, I suspect that most of you today are familiar with Judy and or Megan, but for the benefit of those further afield who um, may watch the recording after the fact, I'll just do a quick intro um, to our speakers. So Judy Hewitt leads our risk and uncertainty research theme, and she's a professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Auckland and has recently retired from NIWA. She's a statistical marine ecologist who has worked extensively in estuarine and coastal systems. Megan Carbines is a principal scientist at Auckland Council, and she's played a substantial role developing and overseeing SGI monitoring programs in the Auckland region, where land-derived sediment inputs has been a concern. So the work that Megan oversees contributes to MFE's National State of the Environment reporting, and it informs policy and management of the coastal zone. So Megan's been involved with Sustainable Seas Challenge research for a number of years, um, first in an advisory capacity and then contributing co to the um, co-development of many of our current research projects. Um, before I hand over to Megan, I just have a bit of quick housekeeping about the session. Um, so Megan and Judy are going to present for about 20 minutes and then we'll have um, 25 to 30 minutes for Q&A and discussion. Um, so to ask a question or join the discussion, you do have two options. Um, if you're feeling shy, you can just raise your hand um, and I will be, sorry, this is if you want to speak boldly, um, you can raise your hands and I will un enable your mic so that you can unmute yourself. If you haven't been in a Zoom webinar, it's slightly different. I can't unmute you, you unmute yourself. Um, or secondly, you can submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I will read these questions out to the presenter so that everybody can hear them. Um, and it's on the recording. Uh, you can submit those questions to the Q&A panel at any time during the presentation, or you should be able to. Um, whichever you choose, it does help if you include your name and 
organization. So the, the, the context of where the question is coming from is there. So over to you, Megan. Thanks, Robin. Kia ora koutou um, and welcome and thanks everyone for coming along. I'm just going to give an outline to um, the monitoring within the Manukau Harbour and then Judy's going to talk about the Sustainable Seas and Tipping Point projects and the analysis of the Manukau Harbour data and then step through those lessons learned. I'll finish up with how the programme has developed over time following some of those lessons and how we've been able to benefit from the long-term data and then we'll open up for discussion and um, questions. So over a year ago, the um, PC report came out around managing our estuaries, a report that clearly outlines the estuaries in trouble and long-term monitoring programs are a key part of developing that information. We need to um, manage estuaries better. Um, next slide, please, Robin. So long-term monitoring programs are crucial for defining the state of the environment, understanding that natural temporal variability, thinking about the changes and identifying um, those that are attributable to manageable anthropogenic stresses, so being able to target our management based on that data. Also providing that baseline information, including where we've made past management decisions and we're now looking at new baselines and tracking trends to inform future management strategies. Next slide. So there are many conversations going on within and among local and central government agencies, as well as within iwi and communities around monitoring estuaries, both for regional and national reporting, for management and for the implementation of the national policy statement for freshwater management. So monitoring has been occurring in the Manukau Harbour for over 30 years, and many lessons have been learned along the way which could be useful as part of that conversation, not to determine the monitoring standards or protocols, but to think about the core aspects that are important in long-term monitoring programs and what we can learn from that long-term data. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So most people will be familiar with the Manukau Harbour having flown into or out of Auckland Airport. Um, which gives you a fair idea of some of the infrastructure that surrounds that harbour. The body of water and surrounding catchment has a long and close relationship with the people of Tamaki Makaurau as a waterway, as a source of kai, as a place for recreation and a place to live. The area is significant for Māori. Its shoreline is home to some of the earliest settlements in Aotearoa and the harbour and its surrounds hold many sites that are strong spiritual and cultural significance and value. The impacts that humans have had on the Manako has been significant and the harbour has a long history of both modification and pollution with industrial stormwater and wastewater discharges, um, including Auckland's major Mangari wastewater treatment plant discharging to the harbour, um, in addition to the catchment clearance. So over half of the um, land cover is exotic grassland associated with farming, um, but we also have 9% with intensive aquaculture uh, horticulture and cropping, and 12% only covered by um, native forest, and most of that sits in the Waitakere Ranges, and the urban area makes up 16% of the catchment. So in terms of Auckland, that's quite a, a diverse mix, um, but different to many of our other catchments, which are quite urbanised. Um, this one has a strong uh, rural land use as well. Uh, next slide. So the benthic ecology and coastal water quality monitoring started in 1987 um, and this was the genesis for much of our regional monitoring programs with monitoring being progressively rolled out across the rest of the region following what we started in the Manukau um, and as you'll see from this diagram other aspects of environmental monitoring have been added to the Manukau catchment over time as well um, but that monitoring starting in 1987 was really the the genesis and starting point for some really concerted monitoring programs. Uh, next slide. So as I said, it started in 1987, and I really want to acknowledge the foresight of both the environmental managers and the scientists who set up that monitoring at the time and in the way that they did, um, which has given us quite a firm um, foundation for, for going forward from there. The program focused on the sediment characteristics and selected macrofauna at each location. 
Um, it followed a spatially and temporally nested design, which Judy's going to talk to a bit more around how that came about. Uh, it has sites at each of the main arms of the harbour, so trying to pick up um, the main inputs to that um, harbour. There are two sites that were permanently monitored and four other sites that have been monitored um, bi-monthly but with rest periods, so generally monitored for two years and then five years of not being monitored. Um, and in October each year, um, we monitor the full taxa suite, um, which enables us to look at a range of indicators. And so that's six sites across the main body of the harbour. You'll be aware how large the um, Monaco Harbour is. And over time, we've supplemented that monitoring with less regular sampling um, up, up the tidal creeks, which is annual to um, five yearly. Right, I'll pass to Judy. Okay, so I guess I'd just like to start off by saying that this is more than just a monitoring program. The relationship that began in 1987 and has continued through a very large number of changes in letterheads of the two organisations has actually led to a, a lot of fruitful research and learnings. Particularly over the last few years, the Sustainable Seas Phase 1 Tipping Points project offered us a place and funding to query the monitoring programs around some new thoughts, particularly those associated with the detection of tipping points and the impacts of climate, both change and just variability. Uh, next slide, please. So tipping points and time series are particularly linked together. The idea that you can't actually see a trend occurring until the change has actually occurs does actually create a fundamental rethink on how to detect and to monitor for these things. And also the research on early warning signals suggested initially that we'd see actually a really strong increase in variability just before the threshold occurred. Uh, post that, we've actually um, see more that it's actually just a change in variability. So it may be an increase, it may be a decrease, but it's a change in that variance. And that kind of also reiterates that need for those long-term monitorings. And another thing is that actually a lot of tipping points actually occur when climate change is added to other stresses. Uh, next point, uh, next slide. Okay, so from all this work and these remunerations, we've come up with these seven lessons for long-term monitoring. Um, while they come from the Manukau and the Manukau monitoring program, and most of them are being expressed as um, related to species abundances, um, a lot of the lessons can be applied more applicably, and in particular, the first two lessons apply to all long-term monitoring programs. Next slide, please. So when you're starting, there are some design factors that need to be decided upon at the start pretty much where and over what area you're going to sample. That's kind of the first really important one. What are you going to sample and how large a sample do you need? Now the Manukau um, monitoring for the macrofauna focuses on a core that's 30 centimetre, 13 centimetres in diameter. That just wasn't kind of picked up because it happened to be the size of a, a plastic plumbing pipe that we could actually find. There are lots of sizes of plumbing pipes and we actually tested a lot of them. What we were looking for was the size of a, a sampling unit that would actually allow us to collect a reasonable number of species, reasonable abundances of those species, but actually have quite a low variance. Um, so that was the initial thing that we did before we actually did anything with respect to the monitoring program. After that, when, you, when you're sampling um, spatially, you need to think about how you're going to sample. Is it going to be purely random or are you going to stratify things? And stratifying across your site means that you can actually um, reduce that amount of spatial variability that's going to be changing with time. Uh, how many replicates do you need? The very first time we went out, we had absolutely no idea. So we actually collected three times the amount that we actually thought we were going to need and then analysed after that first time um, to reduce in time for the next sampling occasion to um, the number that we've been maintained throughout the programme. And then finally, and with what frequency. Um, next slide, please. 
so after the end of the first year, we actually did look at um, the, the frequency just to see whether or not six times per year was going to be useful or was a total overkill. Um, and we made the decision at the end of that year to continue. But you can't kind of um, just set that up and leave it as it is. Monitoring does need to be reviewed over time. What size changes can the monitoring program detect when you actually get out there and actually look at the answers? Um, can it be improved and made cost more effective? Do you really need that number of replicates or to sample that often? So after five years, we did actually look to see whether or not the size of changes that we could detect were affected more by replication or frequency. Could we drop either of these? If you look at this particular figure, the, um, the species abundances in the, the dark line, um, which is the, the actual 12 replicates, shows uh, low abundances each year in February. If instead of having 12 replicates, we'd only taken three replicates, um, we would have had something like the dashed line instead. So much more variable variability, which was sufficient not to be able to detect much in the way of changes going on. Um, when we looked at, at doing this, we actually found that both the replication and the frequency were really important. We really couldn't drop them. And the only thing that we could do was because there was um, congruency across the harbour and some of the sites in terms of, of how they were responding, um, we dropped some of the sites out instead, as Megan had mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. So at the end of that five years, we actually um, looked at what sort of variability we were finding. We were expecting that we'd see seasonal changes, we'd see multi-year cyclic patterns, and that things may well be very unpredictable. What we found was that most species abundances are predictable. Only 14% weren't predictable. Um, they were either consistently low or they had these cyclic patterns. And even with the cyclic patterns, we could still detect trends. 29% of the species across the six sites, we could actually detect trends on. However, that was only five years. Uh, next slide, please. And when you've got a really short time period, like five years, you have to ask yourself, is that actually a trend that you're seeing or is it really just part of a multi-year cycle? And species abundances and even sediment characteristics do tend to show lots of multi-year cycles. Uh, to date, we've seen cycles from as, as low as three years up to 15 years long. And a lot of these are driven by um, climate variability. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> that must be the double up one. So the kind of natural variability that we see though is actually really useful when you're predicting risks associated with different activities. We can use that time series, that, that time variability um, by using time series analysis and still detect trends. For example, there is a trend running through that plot there and we were able to actually detect it. Next one, please. Um, we can also incorporate southern oscillation indexes into analyses because we know that a lot of the variation we see is actually driven by that. That's a really strong driver of climatic change in New Zealand. And the effect it has is different on the east coast and the, the west coast. Um, so in this, this plot, the, again, the, the solid line is the actual species abundance. The dashed line is what we would predict using the Southern Oscillation Index and air temperature. And as you can see, the fit's pretty damn good. Next, please. Go moving from the, the monitoring program into the tipping point stuff, we actually found that we were more able for the Manukau to detect tipping points during La Nina rather than El Nino events. And this is partly due because the La Nina um, having the the, not the, the westerly winds which sweep across the Manukau, the, the, the El Nino events have um, much greater temporal variability, probably driven by those, those winds. Next one, please. Uh, lesson five is very specific to the Manukau. So um, 
we have actually been able to detect an approach of a tipping point. <laughs> the, um, in the Manukau, around about uh, 2001, 2002, um, they changed the um, sewage treatment. So they removed some oxidation ponds that were discharging into the um, Manukau just up from one of our sites. And what we saw was an increase in variability, which is what we were expecting to see. Um, so this plot shows the seasonal variability at the site um, before the removal of the input, where it was being driven by the dynamics of the tube worm, the cardia. So it was reasonably variable to begin with. Then once the um, management action took place, post the removal, we get the sudden surge in variability. The, the, seasonality of the community it was just sort of flicking wildly all over the place and then the community changed to a new type of community and the variability dropped markedly now this was when the sampling was being conducted six times a year uh, next slide please so we also looked at um, what would happen if we um, if we actually impose changes, we, we put changes in there, how likely we would be actually be able to detect them if we sampled once, so annually, twice per year, four times a year, six times a year. So this work was conducted in the Tipping Point project by myself, Fabrice Stevenson, Rich Bulmer and Simon Thrush. And there's a little link down there if you want to actually go and have a look at this. So for Bacardia, that tube worm mat that I was talking about, um, it declines consistently as you increase your sampling frequency within the year, you can consistently detect smaller and smaller changes. For other species, it wasn't quite such a consistent decline. Ostravenus, for example, you can start off by only detecting 86% of a change. And then as you go through, you can get down to a small change like 20, 30%. They all showed slightly different responses, but for all of them, you could detect a much smaller change if the sampling was conducted more than twice a year. Next one, please. So lesson six is true generally for species data around the world. Community analyses are much stronger than single species analyses at detecting small changes. And there's three reasons for this. The small changes that you see in a species abundant not only accumulate over time, but they also accumulate through species interactions. So say you have one species that is actually really quite sensitive and it's going to change a little bit, but it actually also facilitates another species. So that species is not just affected by the, the change in, in, the, um, in the stressor, but also by that change in that other species. Moreover, the species respond in different ways. So when we actually set up the monitoring program, we selected species that would be affected in different ways by different stresses. Some of them would increase, some of them would decrease, some of them wouldn't show any change at all associated with a particular stressor. Some would respond to two different stresses. But the fact that they all do different things means that we can actually look into it, query it, and assign causality and type of stressor that's actually causing it. And then finally, it just remains a, a fact that rare species are often more sensitive than other species, possibly because they're at the, the edge of their ranges, and so they, they just they don't have that robustness and resilience in there. Uh, next one. So getting back again to the tipping points the work that I did with Rich and, and um, Simon and Fabrice, um, the longer the data set, the more frequently the data is collected, the more use it is for determining effects, but only if breaks in the collection of the data are minimal. Um, and that's obviously something that's happening these days with Auckland in lockdown um, and not able to actually get out there and collect data. But this shows that um, when we analysed, I mean, generally speaking, we expect that you'll be able to detect more of effect when you have more, um, more data points. That's a kind of statistical thing. But in this case, we were actually able to analyse and separate out the effect of the number of data points from the actual duration 
over which they were collected and the frequency with which they were being collected, basically by dropping um, sampling points in and out. And what we found was for nearly all the species, number of data points wasn't actually important. It was duration and frequency. And the longer the duration and the more frequently you sampled, the smaller the change you could actually detect. Next one. But what we also know from this, this pro program is that if you've got some sites continuously monitored in your network, you can actually detect changes in the other sites that you monitor by using that as a context. And so this just shows um, one site that's continuously monitored, site CB, which is the, the solid line with another one that is going to coming in and coming out, KP, which is the dashed line. And you can see how closely they mim mimic each other. Uh, sufficient that we can probably say that that gap, that, that drop that occurred at KP, which reflects the CB one, probably occurred at pretty much the same time. Uh, next slide, and I think I'm passing back to Megan. Yes. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Judy. Cool. So some of the important lessons um, from an operational point of view were that a strong design up front and a strong time series enabled detection of some important changes, like the, um, the changes to the wastewater treatment plant. But it also gave us some flexibility to change how we monitored as required. So periodic review of both what was being found and the design enabled us to make responsive changes. For example, monitoring at our Cape Horn site was initially on one of the sites that was rested. Um, so monitored only every five years for two years. Um, but as the pond removals were due to happen in the Mangari um, treatment plant, it was brought back in and we monitored it um, on the same frequency as the continuous sites from 2001 to 2010 to allow us to focus monitoring on that particular um, change. At other times, resting sites have been monitored out of cycle if there were changes of interest detected in the analyses when we did the sort of reviews. Um, and more recently, because we have the long data set to draw on, rather than adding these sites back in for bi-monthly monitoring, um, we've been able to sample them in the October when we do all that um, taxa and make comparisons between the years and among the sites to determine whether they need to be monitored annually, more frequently, or can be rested. Um, so as time's gone on, we've got more and more flexibility with um, how we're able to work um, the monitoring within that harbour. Also by moving to those rotational sites, um, which Judy outlined was the way that they thought would best um, basically save budget within the harbour without compromising its ability to detect changes, we were able to move that budget um, into expanding into other parts of the region. And as we've built the data sets within those harbors, um, after we've developed at least a sort of five year time series within those harbors, we've moved those to rotational sampling also. So that meant we could keep kind of extend, expanding the program um, within a decreasing budget, um, which is something that happens regularly. Um, but it also, as Judy mentioned, the, the higher frequency sampling in the Monaco gave us um, context and confidence for those other programs um, to be able to check back in against and um, implement in some cases sampling at much lower frequencies than we had in the Monaco. So the Monaco really was our kind of our peak investment in terms of establishing that, that context and um, seasonal sort of information for other parts of the region. Um, the tipping point analysis that Judy outlined um, just at the end there really gave us confidence that we could reduce the frequency within the Monaco recently, um, something we had to do as a result of some of the um, COVID constraints we've had on budgets. Um, obviously, it's a really long time series and we're reluctant to, to make changes to that program, but um, we were able to use those analyses to be sure that we could continue to um, keep the integrity of it intact and still um, detect a change as well. And I guess, you know, as for all, all parts of um, New Zealand and right around our region, we've got continuing challenges within the catchment. Um, for Monaco, we've got large areas of it. We'll be going into new urban development. We've got climate change um, impacts that Judy sort of talked a little bit about the influence of climate on the monitoring and emerging contaminants as well as new stresses that are um, 
starting to show in these environments. So we need the monitoring to be able to respond to these um, new stresses, whether it's by allocating budget to look at, um, at new stresses or being able to think about where sites are placed in relation to those um, new areas. But again, coming back to that design at the start, we've picked up all of the major um, confluences or arms of the harbour right at the beginning of that design um, so that we can sort of build out from there as well. So thinking of those things right at the start was um, really important for making sure as we as the harbour continues to change, we've still got a programme that's relevant to that. Uh, next slide, which I think is the final one. So um, we're happy to take uh, questions and um, rather than just a Q&A, we were hoping to hear from others what your experiences and learnings are from establishing monitoring um, and to sort of add them into a discussion around long-term monitoring for estuaries. Um, so I'll just pass back to Robin to explain how the discussion will work again. Um, I'll leave this up for a little bit just so people can um, recap those, those lessons. Thank you. Kia ora, Megan. Kia ora, Julie. Judy, sorry. Um, so, yeah, you can either um, raise your hand if you'd like to sort of ask your question um, uh, by yourself so you can unmute, or um, we actually do have a couple in the Q&A um, box at the moment, so I could kick off with those while, while people have a little have a little think about it. Um, so there's one from Leslie Bolton-Ritchie, um, who I know is regional council, but I can't unfortunately remember which regional council is it. A south one? Um, Canterbury. Canterbury, yes, right, right area. Um, so she says, based on the location of the sites in the Manako Harbour, can you actually determine the anthropogenic drivers of change in the sediments and macro invertebrates over time? For example, stormwater discharges. Uh, yes, I mean, I guess one of the things is that they were sited out on the sand flats. Um, so, um, the changes usually start higher up in the tidal creeks and move out, but yes, we can actually um, we can actually tie those changes back to changes further up in the tidal creeks. We can actually, by the species that are actually being changed, relate them back um, to particular stresses. So I think at present the actual um, monitoring reports actually have a section at the end which actually show um, how many things are changing related to stormwater metals for example or nutrients or sediment accumulation um, so yeah um, Megan do you want to add anything to that? Um, no I think um, you've answered that in terms of um, you know thinking about the board um, drivers of those change I think Leslie the, the difficulty we do have is pinpointing, say, where those stresses are particularly coming from. So in terms of, say, sediment, yes, the changes are related to sediment, but do they come from you know, this development of this land use change? And I think something that's, you know, an issue right across um, all of our monitoring is being able to tie it back to those changes that might be happening at different scales to what our monitoring is. But yes, we can certainly think about, um, we'll talk about what the key drivers of change are, whether they're contaminants or um, sediment. That answer your question, Leslie. Yes, that's good. Excellent. Um, okay, so then we have one from um, Elizabeth Allen. I, oh, there is one hand raised, so I'll come on to that one after we uh, address this question from Elizabeth. Um, it says, Megan, can you tell us what monitoring has been done of sedimentation in Fungata O Harbour? Our group, the Fungata O Harbour Care Group, is increasingly concerned over the sedimentation load entering the harbour from Coxhead Creek. An interesting note is that since the environmental seal of T Point Road and Laika Avenue, the sediment entering the harbour from the source has markedly diminished. Um, yep, I can answer that. So, um, yes, Elizabeth, we've got um, long term ecology monitoring within the harbour, so similar to the Monaco. Um, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. I think there's 10 sites in Whangateau that are monitored, um, established 2009, I think. So very similar to monitoring to what we've outlined here, which focuses on the, um, the ecology at each of those locations, as well as the sediment grain size and organic content of that sediment. Um, and that is reported um, alongside our other estuaries like um, Okura, uh, Puhoi, Wairera. Um, and so, 
on a scale of Whangateau, there are a few sites that have some indication of um, changes that might be related to sediment, um, but it's sitting very much at the um, end of not too much change um, in comparison to, say, somewhere like Puhoi and Okura. Um, I can certainly make sure you can have a copy of that last report, which came out in 2020, analysing all of that data for Whangatea. Okay. Um, we've got a hands up from John Fawn. So, John, you should now be able to unmute yourself. Ooh. Kia ora, Megan. Kia ora, Judy. Uh, it's John here from um, uh, Environment Reporting uh, at StatsNZ. Um, I um, uh, am interested uh, whether there's sort of two questions. First one is um, in terms of the sort of setup of the surveying and the purpose, is it kind of clear, um, or what, uh, and I might have missed it, is it clear whether you're trying to sort of understand the change in the health of the estuaries at specific sites, or are you trying to kind of say, look, this is the health overall of the estuary? Because it sort of seemed like you're doing sampling, which suggested it was for the overall health of the estuary. But then you kind of talked about going back to selected sites at selected places, which didn't kind of sound like a, you know, some sort of random sample. So I was just sort of intrigued, you know, whether you were kind of doing both or how that worked. And then the second question was, um, is there um, any national level, you know, rather than just being the Monaco Harbour, um, any sort of data that we could possibly use at a, at a national level environmental reporting um, program? So um, sort of a couple of questions there, please. Oh, um, Judy, do you want to do it? Or I shall I start off and you, you um, add um, in? Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, so the, the type of monitoring is based on kind of sentinel sites. So the, as Megan pointed out, we've selected, we, we've monitored in the different arms. So we're kind of covering the, the whole of the harbour that way. Um, it is just the sand flight flats. So it's the bits of the harbour that are least likely to be changed although that has to be balanced against the fact that they are the bits that are most likely to be sensitive to change. Um, the, the, the concept being that if this bit of the harbour is being impacted, there's absolutely no reason why the site out of all the area should not actually be being affected. So it is representative of whether or not change would be occurring there. With respect to um, the, the dropping the bits out and then the bringing them the bits back in again. I guess we were um, a little wary the first time we did that. Um, and we were, I would say, kind of quite relieved when we analysed the, the, after the first five years of dropping things out to find out that there hadn't actually been changes we didn't expect to see. No, that's not the way I'm putting it. We, we hadn't expected to see any changes in the sites that we dropped out, and indeed we hadn't. So as, you, as Megan pointed out, leaving those sites out or bringing them in are very, very strongly related to what the council knows is going on around the area. Um, I think that's as much as I can say you, Megan. Yep, so I guess just picking it up from there that yes, the overall aim of the project or the of the monitoring is for our sort of regional perspective, so monitoring the overall health of the harbour. Um, and we've got those two sites that are continuous. The other sites that rotate in and out, they always come back into monitoring, so it's not like they're out and we only bring them in if there's an issue. So we do have a, a long time series for those other sites as well, it's just not continuous, um, like those two sites um, as well. So that allows us to think about issues as well as the, the whole health of the harbour. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we've also got um, sites that we monitor in tidal creeks around the harbour. This might answer um, Mark's question as well, that allow us to look at more particular point sources or um, changes in, that are happening further up in the estuary as well. So this program is around the health of the whole harbour. Um, but as much as possible, we try to think about what are the impacts that are occurring, making sure we're not resting a site when we know there's changes occurring in that catchment. Great. Okay. And, oh, and Sorry, I was just going to say in terms of um, national data sets, um, certainly the regional councils, um, most regional councils monitor 
in a similar way to us. Um, and there's been quite a lot of work by the regional councils with MFE and others around what those data sets are and, and how they look in terms of comparability across the country. Great, so thank you very much. Hey, um, as Megan just alluded to, I think I think she's answered Mark Lawrence's question in the Q&A, but I'll read it out for uh, just to double check. So Monaco is a large area and you only have six sample sites. Therefore, how representative of the complete system are these sites in terms of biological change and also sedimentation patterns, so inputs, sediment, remobilization, et cetera? I think you've covered that. Anything to add? Yeah, just reiterating that, again, those six initial six sites were put, put to sort of pick up the main inputs to the main body of the harbour. And then, yeah, we've got these other monitoring sites that have run up the tidal creeks now as well. Can I guess I'd add to that? I mean, there are considerably more than three arms to um, Manukau Harbour. So there are more arms plus hydrodynamic compartments. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, we've got another question in the Q&A and, and I'll just reiterate that although this is a Q&A as well as um, Megan and Judy said, they are open to discussion and people sharing their own experiences. So please don't be shy. Um, so it's another one from Leslie who says, it'd be very useful to have an advice document on the number of replicates that should be used. Like ALC did an assessment of the data to determine the ideal number of replicates for our estuary monitoring program. However, a lot of monitoring gets undertaken for consent, such as wastewater discharges and consultants stick to three replicates per site for the monitoring and will always push back when you argue for more. It is very frustrating. Yeah, it is, isn't it? And actually that's one of the reasons why the, the demonstration that I used was the three replicates. It's kind of something that, that continually sort of pops up. Um, certainly there, there um, are a couple of papers um, that were published around us actually looking at how we decided how many um, replicates to take. And um, I can certainly send those to people or we could actually look at um, creating a, uh, a guidance document that shows that. Okay. Um... So would anyone like to raise a hand to make a comment, ask a question or anything else to type into the chat? Um, any That's thoughts on the guidance question. document? Oh, who's, who's, is That's it? Megan. I'm oh, sorry. That's the question <laughs> was, was... There are regional council scientists that are on the, on the line. If anyone wants to jump in with um, how these fit with their monitoring programs and what they've seen, if there's anything else that they've learnt or um, think we could add to this kind of list. Sure. We've Can got a hands great. up from Anna Madara Smith. You should be able to meet her. Hi. Thanks, Megan. Um, <laughs> I think it fits in really well with a lot of the monitoring that's undertaken around the country. Probably um, timing would be the only thing. We do annual sampling, and I'd, I, I know that a lot of others do as well. Um, what would be really interesting in terms of a guidance document is just looking at um, what impact that. Uh, sampling frequency has on the ability to detect change so that we can start to make decisions around that saying okay well you know we only want to be we only need in this situation to be able to detect x amount of change but in this situation we want to be more prudent and have a higher level yeah i mean that's an interesting um interesting concept and we could certainly um do something like that um and maybe even start looking at that by comparing what we would say from a couple of different places in the Auckland region where we've got more than annual sampling. Um, so again, dropping out um, times with what you're actually getting and what you can see that you can actually do. I mean, I, I kind of think it would be really interesting if we could maybe get to a stage where around the country there were a few sites in different places that were monitored more frequently that people could use. Um, yep, I think that's a great idea. I'll, I'll definitely keen to talk about that a bit more. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Anna. We've got another question that's come in and then a couple of hands raised. So I'll take them in the order that they popped up. So from um, Donna Clark, who's Cawthron. Uh, 
says, Leslie, the original S3 monitoring protocol also did an analysis of the number of samples required and came up with 10 to 12. So that is a document you could reference for estuaries. So more of a comment. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, so the next hands up was Carla Sivaguru, who you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, yeah, this is a question for Judy. Uh, I'm in the process of assessing the New Zealand steel discharge application. Uh, so you mentioned that you um, found a change in the tipping point in relation to base for the treatment plant discharge. So I'm wondering whether you had any similar uh, change in relation to New Zealand steel discharge. Um, uh, no, there is. Oh, I'm getting feedback. Um, there is a sampling site down there um, that that could be looked at. Um, Megan, do you? I know there was some work done down there recently. Um, have you thought about actually querying the the data to look um, for the effect of the the thingy works? Yeah, so I, I don't think it's something that's cropped up in the analyses we've done over our sort of long-term monitoring. It's not something that's being detected, but there is additional consent monitoring done, which also looks at the um, community structure and the and the uses the benthic health indices, actually. So um, I think that would be the first point to look at is putting um, New Zealand Steel's monitoring in the context of our um, longer-term monitoring and seeing if we can look at the change there. Thank you. Yeah, no, the applicant has um, uh, incorporated all the Auckland Council's data and their benthic health data in the assessment, but I just wondered whether any significant trend or any changes observed in the long-term monitoring, as Judy mentioned, in relation to wastewater treatment plant. That's the reason I asked. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to say the reason that, of course, that the wastewater treatment plant one was so clear is because there was a, a definite change so um, when the ponds were um, released and and then the treatment upgraded so um, there was quite a clear change that we we're able to detect I guess and as opposed to say an ongoing discharge that's been the same potentially. But the applicant's argument is they have also improved a lot of treatment in relation to their discharge but the key contaminants are different again yeah. Yeah cool. Thank you. Yeah. I guess the interesting thing with the um with the oxidation ponds was that it wasn't just the oxidation pond um, change so the kind of the decrease in the nutrients the the tube mat that I talked about actually um, had these really strong five to seven year cycles that it goes through and that it actually also likes very very mild nutrient enrichment so mm -hmm. the um, so the removal of that very, very mild nutrient enrichment at a particular point when it was actually decreasing in abundance at any rate um, was actually made worse for the whole community because the tube worm mat actually stabilizes the sediment out there. Yeah. And at the same time as everything was decreasing, we, we went into a, um, a change in the El Nino La Nino cycles. So basically the sediment couldn't have actually be held there and a lot of the species disappeared because of that. So it was one of those kind of like almost perfect storms. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Leslie, you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, just a couple of things. At Environment Canterbury, we have a number of sites and we only monitor them uh, once a year and cost and resources are a significant factor for that rather than twice or more than that a year. But I'm also of the opinion that a lot of the current state of our estuaries is due to historic activities rather than kind of on the ground changes that are occurring at present. So it's like they were they were bad and they've been bad for maybe 50 years because of all the deforestation and the things that happened when they 
used to transport things across the estuaries and drive cows and that across them and stuff. So just a comment there because it, I find it quite hard to pick out what's happening here, current day stresses compared to the historic. Yeah, that's quite interesting, Leslie. In fact, the, one of the reasons why the um, Manukau monitoring started was um, because it had already undergone a number of changes and there have been some reports out about the amount of um, contaminants kind of around about the place and various bits of it. And the, the um, council was actually going to do some work on a lot of the inputs that were coming in and they wanted to actually be able to show that they were having an effect or at the very least that things weren't getting worse um, and they did actually find it quite useful I think 20 years later when they actually had a big kind of 20 years of the monitoring program to be able to get up there and say look you know things haven't got worse um, so I mean, a problem, legacy is a problem, and the Manukau has legacy in terms of the amount of sediment that's, that's in there. Um, I remember the first time I went to the Maharangi Harbour after working in the Manukau, and I was absolutely staggered to see that there was an estuary where I could get out and get in kind of up to my knees, and I could still see my feet. Um, so, yeah, rambling, but I think it's got something to do with what you were saying. Yeah, I think I'll just add to that, Lizzie, that yes, definitely in the case of the Manukau, what we've been tracking is, is in many cases, improvements um, in the ecology, but also the water quality over the longer term. Um, so I guess it's important to think about monitoring. Hopefully some of our things are going to get better. Um, but on the flip side, many of our other locations, yes, they're highly impacted already, but they're also continuing to show changes, um, you know, declines as well. So there's definitely a historic aspect to it, but um, that doesn't discount in our case that there's still ongoing um, changes. The other comment I was going to make um, in relation to something you said and also Anna around the cost and the sort of doing samples annually um, due to cost. One thing to think about that we've found with our budgets is that if you're doing it annually, obviously you've got to monitor for quite a lot longer in terms of data until you can get that sort of trend or work out what's going on enough to have this sort of flexibility. So your cost might be less in terms of an annual cost, but it's greater in terms of the length of time you need to monitor for. So we've got some locations that we monitor much less frequently. Um, all our small estuaries are on sort of two years, uh, sorry, two years, um, twice yearly. And it's taken us a lot longer in those locations to kind of have the strength that we've got in these other estuaries where we've monitored more frequently um, and, you know, less flexibility to decrease the number of sites. So we've had to monitor more sites for a longer period of time. So I haven't done the numbers, but I suspect that actually, if you look at a 10 year budget, your cost might be less if you spend more up front and then reduce your costs over time than spending less each year. I'd, something to think about or look at, I think. Okay. Um, we have another question in the um, Q&A box. So it's from Cynthia Roberts. In response to concerns about over-harvesting, the Avon Heathcote Yehutai Estuary Trust Christchurch is about to conduct a cockle survey. This has been done several times over the last 20 years. Any comment about the single species monitoring, given your earlier comments about community sampling giving the best results for estuary health? Um, I'll start answering that and hopefully I won't be drowned out by my dog. I'm sorry, the, the problems of working from home under lockdown. Um, I'll just shut the door too. But the I, I guess the thing is, it, it depends on what you're really interested in. So if there are other um, species that can actually show the, the changes that may be more sensitive than cockles, because that's actually really important. Um, there are a number of species that are actually more sensitive than cockles to suspended sediment, for example, um, and also copper contamination. Um, then, then that's a good reason for that for that monitoring. But at the same time, kind of like if what you're really really interested in is the cockles, 
then they're the best thing to monitor. And if you're monitoring for your general macrofauna, you'd probably be using a smaller size core than you would be if you're actually looking at cockles, because in that case, you're probably wanting to look at the population dynamics and the, the age structure of the cockles and how big they're getting, because they're having a lot of really small cockles is often a sign of, of a stressed population. Um, Fongatiao, for example, which somebody raised, actually has had a long-term uh, one-off cockle survey being done by the University of Waikato that's actually occurred for very many years before the, um, the Auckland Council monitoring started, I believe. Is that right, Megan? Um, yes, yeah, so there's both the University of Waikato and also the community monitoring within Fongatiao, um, which has focused on the, on the shellfish. And I hope Judy will come back with her point, but um, I guess it, you know, for those, the yeah, the focus yeah. being for those the, the shellfish populations because the interest was in, in those sort of the shellfish that's been harvested. And I think Judy, you were going to say around the uh, focusing on that was looking at the population shifts and the recruitment or lack of recruitment. Yeah. And of course, it did turn out to be quite helpful when there was that sudden cockle die off. Yeah, just recently. Yeah, so I guess you know the answer to that question is if your if your um, interest is in the um, in the shellfish for harvesting purposes, then that would be you know the thing to focus on. But to think about the whole population size as well. Um, well, I think we have come to a natural conclusion uh, right on time, um, unless anyone's got a, a burning last minute question to, to add in there. Um, so I will just close us off now, just say thank you very much to our speakers, particularly both of you who've been suffering under lockdown for many weeks now. Um, so appreciate you taking the time and, and brain space um, to, to share this information with us. And thank you to everybody and, and um, shared your comments and questions. Um, just a, a, a quick um, sort of comment really that if you have any comments about the guidance document itself, we'd really welcome that, any feedback. It's extremely useful for us in terms of um, how we formulate things going forward. So whether it's useful or not, um, or in, whether it's too detailed or not detailed enough in certain areas, any, any kind of feedback, um, about the, the tools and resources that we're producing, such as this one, um, is extremely useful. So please don't be shy. Um, and I will put a link to the e-version of that um, guidance document into the wrap-up email, along with the um, link to the recording and the presentation slides from today. Um, these should be out by the end of the week. Um, the only slight caveat, it being a short week, if it's not for any reason, it will be by the end of Monday at the latest, but we are definitely aiming for the link to come out before Friday. Um, so that was it. Thank you all very much for joining us today. I hope it was informative and useful and thank you again to our speakers. Kia ora. Uh -huh.